Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Yeah. All right. Friday night. We're all, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is David Cunion. I'm the curator of this fine establishment, the New Orleans Jazz Museum. Thank you so much for coming out and supporting us, not only here, but I see a lot of you all over this place all the time. Thank you for coming out and supporting us. We really appreciate it. Uh, let me remind you there are a couple things that are coming up. Uh, in general, we do have music here uh, every day, Tuesday through Friday, uh, usually Tuesday, Wednesday in the afternoons, uh, 2 o'clock. Correct me if I'm... If we got that? Good. Okay, 2 o'clock. Uh, and Tuesday evenings on the balcony, about 5 o'clock. Uh, and Fridays we have... What time are the Fridays? 2 o'clock. Okay, 2 o'clock. I'm trying to get to these. I'm usually working, but I um, also want to remind you that for those of you who are jazz fans, and you wouldn't be here if you were not, uh, on the 18th of November at 5 p.m., we've got our prime example series. Uh, we have Jesse McBride bringing in musicians to kind of celebrate the great prime example club that was on St. Bernard. Um, no, it was on Broad and St. Bernard um, that most of you had been to, and, and you know, Julius Kimber ran a great place. Uh, so he brings in musicians to kind of get the jam session spirit of that place. Uh, and the two other things I must remind you of. One, uh, our next exhibit is called Exit Stage Right, the Zach Smith Festival Portraits. Uh, Zach Smith, photographer in town, has taken kind of side stage portraits of musicians for the past 10 to 15 years. We're going to be putting them on the second floor. Uh, they are great and and, you know, Fun stuff. That is our opening for that is on the Friday the 3rd. And of course, the night after that is our Improvisations Gala, our main fundraiser for the year. Go to the museum website so you can get tickets. We've got all sorts of great acts and the usual baby dolls and fun things to be had. And of course, because it's the Jazz Museum, the liquor will be flowing. So, um, <laughs> so uh, now that we have that out of the way, um, we're going to talk about this fine exhibit, which has been a great success for you know the museum, for Emily, um, and on a great personal level, I have really liked having it here and walking through it. Um, it has meant a lot to me and affected me emotionally in a really good way. And I see some of y'all out there who have uh, loaned us stuff for that. Thank you, thank you for allowing us to have that on the walls here. Uh, I present to you. Emily Rees, artist, bon vivant, and I don't know, what else can we call you? And, yeah. and uh, um, now a publisher. And, and now a published author. Look at that. Um, all right. Uh, you have put together this PowerPoint that we're going to get moved through, but I wanted to kind of just first, you know, ask you, we wanted to talk about kind of the cover Mm -hmm. And the paintings on the cover. Um, do you want to start with the the kind of the waifs home, or do you want to start with yes. the? Yes. Okay. Let's start with the waifs home. And in fact, um, I have a slight little bit of animation here, which will help to illustrate where we are. So this little vignette turns into the big painting, and it's the colored waifs home homage by me. I worked off a photograph that Louis Armstrong had in his personal collection. Um, and in fact, he drew an arrow just to make sure that nobody missed <laughs> who was Louis Armstrong in the picture. He drew an arrow on the photograph pointing to uh, the figure who is in, in, uh, wearing the cap uh, with the, the green in his, uh, um, his outfit. And um, it was by Ballard Patio. Uh, circa 1913, and it was an incredible moment in this young man's life. He's maybe 13 years old, and he learns how to play the cornet in this home. The gentleman sitting below him holding the number 27 is Peter Davis, who taught all of these kids, uh, but particularly focused, I think, on Lewis. And I'm just so moved by the mentorship that you see in this picture by the power of Lewis's physical stance. He's on top of the world, even though he's just been incarcerated. 
but he, he feels the power of the band and of the music and he knows already he's a performer. He had already been performing on streets as a singer for years. And I think that's why this, this photograph and therefore working on this painting, um, Lars, what does that mean? Really? <laughs> but no. Um, or, not sure. Tap the screen? The big screen. Oh. Oh, it's that one that's doing it. Oh, okay. Oh, hey. all right. Sorry, Lars, that wasn't yours. <laughs> this is Lars's laptop. Thank you, Travis. That's, that's why I was thinking. Uh, Right, so that's that, and uh, technology is such a wonderful thing, isn't it? Though, <laughs> so back to the cover. Okay. Uh, then I wanted to highlight the cornet, and I wanted it to be a silhouette on the cover, so that we we had so much activity between the two artworks. The second artwork we'll get to in a sec. Uh, so I thought a silhouette will really make it stand out, which it does, but. I thought, well, let's see the real cornet as it relates to the cover, and there it is. This is the cornet that Louis Armstrong learned how to play while he was in the Colored Waifs home of New Orleans. And it's down, for cover. those of you know this, but it's downstairs on the second floor if you haven't seen it. Please go the, see it. Yeah, it is. Uh, so now let's move on to the Rockmore painting on the cover, which is the magnificent Bourbon Street Parade which the museum acquired in 2017. Mm -hmm. We got it. Uh, a friend of the museum's by the name of um, Ronald Schwartz uh, called up the director, Greg Lambusi, and said, we, I have this painting. You know, it is a Noel Rockmore. We would like to, I would like to donate it. And Greg said, of course, sure. And so we go. It was in his office uh, around, at Turo on Britannia. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it's Big. It's a rather large painting. It's probably about 10 to 12 feet long, maybe four, you know, three, four feet high. Uh, and Greg and I had to kind of wrestle is the wrong word because we didn't wrestle it, but we had to wrestle it into the elevator and down, you know, a couple stairs and and in here. Um, and then Greg called Emily and said, "Oh, we want you to come see this. We have, you know, one of your dad's paintings which just donated and." You tell the story after that. Well, this was incredible. I walk in, and uh, I'd like to jump to this photograph, because this is just after seeing the painting for the first time since, I don't know when, a long time yeah. before. And I said, you won't believe this, but I worked on this painting with my dad, uh, briefly, at the very end of its development. And uh, I don't know, it's, it, it, was, it was crazy seeing it, because I had no idea what the museum had acquired. But I love this painting so much. It, it is filled with so many fascinating uh, details. And in the book, um, I had the opportunity to highlight a, a great number of those in different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, for one, there's all sorts of interesting, you know, French Quarter characters yes. um, all over this. Um, you know, uh, there's, I think that's Thomas Jefferson and mm -hmm. Fat Man Williams. Of course, I only know the musicians. Um, right. And name some of the other folks who are in this who were hanging around. Well, Al St. Germain is at the center, the bearded gentleman. He owned Bourbon, uh, the Bur uh, uh, Maison Bourbon. And his daughter is, is to the left of him, the young, young girl with the big flower on her dress. And below her is Al's wife. And uh, both of them worked in the bar, too. Uh, so, so there are real people like that, and then there are fantasy people. Like, who is the, the, the Japanese character? I, I find it fascinating that he tucked a, um, a character from a Japanese painting into this one. Uh, and, and we see also uh, a lot of collage, um, uh, Victoriana. Uh, my dad was, for whatever reason, utterly transfixed by uh, the sort of almost faux innocence of uh, the uh, sentimentality of the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. And he loved to put things in his artworks as a contrast 
to uh, a certain harshness or darkness. And I, I find, I think that works really, really well in this piece. Well, when you worked on this with your dad, the, the, there's a whole story behind you coming to New Orleans and how, wasn't that the first time you'd come to New Orleans to see him? Yes, um, we met though in New York. Um, he went back and forth between New Orleans and New York between his first uh, uh, visit in 1959 to 1977 when he moved here definitively and then didn't leave again uh, in terms of living. Um, so I think that there are some pictures later on that will help okay. illustrate that. So okay, we'll, we'll we, will, so we that. will save that for later. Yeah. So um, let's see, in fact, where this goes. Here's a photograph of my dad and me in the background working on this painting, very close to the end of it. It's nearly finished. Where, and where was that? Where was that studio? I don't know. Okay. Somewhere in the corner. In the corner. I okay. just don't know where exactly it was. Probably Rita. It could have been. 800 block That of would make it. sense. Okay. okay. We moved into that later. Yeah. And I wanted to show the frontispiece of the book. It's um, the top photograph is, is, as it says, from 1963. And it shows Larry Bornstein, who was my dad's dealer at that time, and my dad with a lot of the jazz paintings arrayed around them. And this picture was taken next door to Preservation Hall. It's a pizza shop right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the same room. And Larry, when Preservation Hall got started, he moved his art gallery from that building to next door for a while. Okay. And so in 2019, I said to Courtney, my dealer, and uh, to Esther Rose, who was helping me also at the time, and to our photographer tonight, uh, Sophia Germer, I said, I want to try to um, mimic that original photograph for the book. I, I really had this vision. I wanted this to be the frontispiece. And so in my studio on Orleans Avenue, we set up all of my paintings, which I had just finished for this exhibition, and staged the picture. And uh, I loved the way it turned out. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, and I like the fact that, of course, from, you know, the your the photo of you and Courtney. There's paintings that are in the exhibit, um, but also mm -hmm. the Johnny Wiggs that's on the, the Wiggs. right corner is also um, courtesy of Russ Dalton um, is mm -hmm. uh, is in the exhibit too. So mm -hmm. nice to see that up there. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. So I thought now would be a good time to introduce where did Noel Rockmore come from? So here are some very early pictures of his parents. Um, his father, to me, looks like a vaudevillian. I've never heard of him having been a stage <laughs> performer, but, and his mother, she just is so beautiful. Uh, they both were artists. They, um, he had no uh, uh, formal training. He had training more as an apprentice, a printer's apprentice originally, and turned out to have a great knack for illustrating things. And so that's how he got started. But Gladys actually went to the Chicago Art Institute. She was a, a graduate of the school. And uh, then they married in, in 1925, and along comes Noel. Now his father was six foot four, and his mother was perhaps five feet. And here is his mother um, with, with him and with uh, sister Debbie. Now I don't know how many people who know my dad's work, I don't know if you know that he was also a musician. Oh yeah. Uh, but he could play a lot of instruments just improvising. And he uh, did study as a child, as you can see. As did Debbie. Debbie was uh, a, a pianist. 
This photograph shows a vignette, um, and it brings up something I wanted to introduce, which is that Gladys and Floyd, from very early in the uh, existence of Life magazine, got hooked in with people there, and they started uh, showing up in the magazine a lot. Uh, the magazine featured their artwork, um, yeah. and they were being photographed a lot by Life magazine photographers, and this is a Life magazine photograph. I don't think it ever appeared in print in the magazine, but it would be one of a gazillion photographs that were taken and didn't make it in. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point is, is that my dad grew up being used to professional photographers showing up in the house and or in the studios. This is Gladys's studio at this point, uh, and and taking pictures of them all. And also being around art and music. And, and being around you know, art and, and music. And artists and musicians yes. and things. Yes, because his parents were working artists. They made yeah. their living off of, off of art. And I wanted to show a tantalizing little, little tidbit, which is this photograph is in the early, uh, late, late 30s, about 1939. And in 1941, we see that Gladys Rockmore Davis, my dad's mother, had an exhibition here in New Orleans on Royal Street. Huh. Yeah. And um, someday I hope to find out more about this because it's, it's just fascinating to realize that the name Rockmore was here 18 years before my dad showed up. Interesting. Yeah. This is 1941 in um, April. And it's at the Arts and Crafts Club of New Orleans at 712 Royal Street. And then I wanted to jump a little bit to uh, speaking of Gladys and Floyd's uh, World War II service. They both were artist war correspondents. Now my grandfather Floyd, he flew in some missions, like for instance over the bombing of Hamburg. Um, he was one of those artists who went out and just did lots of different kinds of missions mm -hmm. uh, and, and recorded what he saw. My grandmother, I only know of two times when she went overseas, and one of the primary one was 1944. She and Floyd were hired by the War Department and Life Magazine to, to do a series of artworks on the liberation of Paris. And it became a 10-page spread in Life magazine. And I'm showing some of the pages here. So on the right is a painting by Gladys. How marvelous. It's a cabaret scene. These are some more Not that paintings. you have ever painted a cabaret scene in your well, life. Well, I know. Uh, here are some scenes around, around town. They, they were told, just observe whatever you would like to, to tell us the story of what does Paris look like now that it's been liberated. And this is a large painting by Floyd. Um, he caricatured himself and Gladys on the bottom left. In the center, you see Janet Flanner, William Shirer, and uh, Hemingway rather a, a brilliantly pilloried there. Um, on the top, um, the penultimate fellow is uh, Robert Kappa. And um, there's a just a fascinating slew of people uh, in, in this picture. Um, it's definitely not one of your dad's pictures, but you can see where, you could definitely see the progression. Yes. And, you know. That was one of the reasons I, I wanted people to see this is because putting together a, uh, a mural-like picture uh, was something that he might have observed his father doing because this was not the only such piece that Floyd did. Yeah. And then a few more by Floyd. And there's one more picture I wanted to show you because it haunts me, and it's this one. It's of Gladys and Floyd standing in a, a torture chamber uh, in Paris that the, where the Nazis had uh, dispatched brutally uh, partisans, uh, um, just anyone who was against the Reich. And Floyd has a vantage where he could see through what looks like a dark 
chamber, he actually can see through it. And in the next photograph, uh, you can see the painting that he ended up doing that was in Life magazine. So the vantage where we see him in the photograph, this is what he painted. But it was an incredible thing to find the photograph of the two of them together. Now, mind you, I didn't grow up with any of these photographs. Um, when my father left when I was less than two years old, my mother swore off anything about him. No photographs, no artworks, nothing. And that also meant the grandparents. There was no contact with them, nothing. So I have in my adult life been able to acquire by various means lots of pictures to do with this family. And I only saw this photograph, for instance, um, a couple of years ago. Yeah. So you've spent a lot of time kind of going back through your lineage on that side of the family. Well, on both sides, right. really. Um, but having to do particularly for the book, I, I really mm -hmm. focused in on things. And there were things, there was very little I could put in the book about the family because this wasn't the place to get into an right. in-depth discussion of it. But you know how it is. You're looking for something that you're going to place. You need a lot of things to choose from. Yeah. So, but then there were surprises like this. Now, here we are, it's after the war, and Noel um, is at the Putney School of Vermont, which was America's first co-ed prep school. Um, it was a farming school. It was uh, rural, and uh, the kids grew their own food and did all the chores around the place, everything. It was really a, a working farm. And he had an art studio uh, where he became a very, very committed painter. And that's his handwriting on the photograph. And it's 1947. And then I have to bring my beautiful mother in. So they were married in 1951. And this series of pictures shows the connection that as a baby I had with my father and music because there he is, he's playing the violin for me. And this was by a Life magazine photographer, by the way, as is this one. Now some of you have seen this photograph before because I, it's in the book and also I've posted it on Facebook. This was the first photograph I ever saw of my family together, and it was given to me when I was 30 by my father's cousin. Okay. And I remember thinking, we were a family once. We really were. Nobody ever talked of us as a family, but here's the evidence. We were a family. <laughs> I'm the baby. I'm six months old, and my brother Chris uh, is in the foreground on the floor, my sister Robin across from him. And it's interesting, a friend of mine here, Cynthia, she said, you know, Emily, when she saw this photograph a few years ago, she said, she said, Emily, when your father left, so too did the music. And I thought oh. that was very profound. And she said, well, maybe that's partly why music is so critical to you. It's, it's part of your origin. Right. So then I wanted to show a few early pictures of Noel. On the upper left, he's just won a prize on Pirate's Alley for an artwork, and it was, it was uh, in the paper. And the pictures of him painting, that's above the performance space at Preservation Hall. And on the lower left, he's painting Narvin Kimball. And if you're in the hall today, the upholstered seats at the front, that painting is right above, right above it. it. Yeah. Hmm. And this is his, probably his favorite model uh, at the time and a good friend, Chicken Henry. And there, um, they're on the balcony over, am I right? Over balcony Preservation over Hall. Hall. Yeah. And in the background, you can see Dixie's Bar of Music. And that yeah. incredible mural outside yeah. is from that, is from Dixie's Bar. 
And so now we get to some of the pictures in, in the exhibition uh, and some of the instruments. This, this bass, when I first saw it, David, when, when I first saw the show myself, I have to say that one just floored me. And every single time I see it, I just, ah. Oh. I was so glad to be able to bring that out of the archive and put that out, because that's one of my favorite pieces in the whole collection. Yes. Um, for those of you who don't know, that is, <coughs> pardon me, um, Alcide Slow Drag Pavageau's first bass that he made out of a barrel. Um, it has three strings. Um, you can't see from the picture, but there's a key that's one of the tuning pegs. Um, it's really an amazing, an amazing piece. Um, again, when you leave here, you can go downstairs and it's still on display in the, um, in the uh, gallery. Um, and the, um, this one um, is, uh, was loaned to us by the Historic New Orleans Collection. Um, and I didn't know they had it, until about a year before the, you know, we were planning this exhibit and I was starting to try and find things um, to get loans for. And I happened to be walking through the historic New Orleans collection to see something. Um, and it happened to be on the wall. Oh, and I kind of, and I literally kind of walked by and went, went wow. And two, <laughs> we're going to get that. <laughs> we're going to have that here, so. I um, love the fact that he started out as a dancer and that's how he yeah. got the name Slow Drag. Yeah. As mm -hmm. a competitive dancer. Yeah. He won dance contests. Yeah. Being Slow Drag. Yeah. And then on the left here, we have uh, Dee Dee and Billy Pierce, and that is on loan from the Ogden. And I've always adored that painting too. Um, it, it's just so profound. And unusual for this series, it has a bit more high-keyed color and density of paint. Yeah, Billy and Dede, as when I started here, I didn't know too much about them, and now they're two of my favorite musicians. They're, anything you can find to hear by them, they're great. Billy's an incredible barrel house piano player, and Dede is fantastic, just kind of simple trumpet player. Um, and then the Andrew Morgan. I love the uh, elbow in that one, yeah. the, the jumble of fabric. And then the way that the hand holding the clarinet just sort of rises up out of that. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Now here we have uh, Alan Jaffe and my dad walking on St. Peter Street. It's uh, got to be probably early 70s. And uh, I mean, it's just such a marvelous picture. <coughs> they were very, very good friends. But I'm, my dad was lucky. He moved to a place where friendship was, is, is, is an art form. Yeah. You know? And the quarter at that time was populated by a re just remarkable collection of fantastic people. Yeah. It's As Mac Rebenack would it's say, characters. Characters, yes. <laughs> there's still a few, a few yeah, of us there's, left. There's here. still around. There's still a few around. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's 1963. Uh, both the painting by my dad of Chicken Henry and the photograph of them together. And I wanted to bring in Danny Barker because Danny Barker is, is one of the few major uh, elements of the Rockmore side of this show that, that isn't directly related consistently with Preservation Hall. Yeah. Um, and his legacy, I mean, he was a magnificent human being, storyteller, musician, world traveler, all of this, but he was also an extraordinary mentor. I don't yeah. know many musicians today who don't have some connection directly or indirectly to Danny Barker. He, he influenced, you know, through the brass band, you know, through the Fairview Baptist Church band that he started that had kind of every kind of second generation brass band muse musician in it. Um, through his writing, uh, he's a, I mean, I'm speaking to, you know, people who know this, but he, to, for those of you who don't know, Danny Barker was a fantastic writer. 
He's yeah. really a great writer. You can anything you can get by him. And these um, are his his books. Yeah. Um, the one on top was originally published by Oxford University Press in what the 80s. Yeah. And yeah. this is a an edition uh, from the HNOC in 2016, I believe it is, yeah. with, with a fantastic introduction by Gwen Tompkins. Gwen, you here? I thought she was gone. Right. Anyway, Gwen Tompkins, who most of you know, fantastic radio personality and and great writer also. Um, Danny Barker is also kind of, in a way, the, the patron saint, one of the patron saints of the museum, because when Danny moved back to New Orleans in the early 60s, uh, he took a job as being the curator of the New Orleans Jazz Museum when it was on Dumaine Street. So as I tell people, I have Danny Barker's job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to live up to. It certainly is. And this painting has always fascinated me, too, because... It has so much more of a light spirit in, it, in its color scheme. And uh, I mean, he provided for Danny Barker this immense backdrop of, of lovely light azure blue. It's just unusual. Yeah. Now, another favorite model of my dad's was Bill Russell, who was an incredible musicologist, violinist, uh, and Talk about a character, oh my god. <laughs> and here they are in Noel's studio. And in the book, you'll see um, this photograph twice, but not like this, it's heavily cropped. You're seeing the full photograph here. And in the exhibition, we have this incredible etching. Uh, my dad was well known at the, when, when he was uh, younger, he was well known for his etchings. Uh, I don't remember exactly when the last etching was that he might have done, but by the time I met him, I don't think he was doing them anymore. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, David, I would love for you to say something about that marvelous, uh, the, the Jazz Fest watercolor on the left, which is such an unusual um, piece. He did that at the first Jazz Fest in Congo Square. Mm -hmm. um, just, and I haven't seen too many watercolors that he ever did. I don't. Right, well, uh, he did a lot. Okay. He did a lot of them, um, but uh, I don't see a lot of them around either. Um, but what I get a kick out of, and, and I have to take a photograph of this and show it to him, um, is that the Indians who were at the first Jazz Fest were the Wild Magnolias, Bo Dallas and stuff, and the Golden Eagles, uh, Big Chief Monk Boudreaux, who's a friend of mine still around, living up on Valance Street. So uh, I have to take, I want to take a photograph of this to Monk to see if he remembers, you know, what his suit that year looked like and whether, you know, it's he this one, that one, or that one, or at all there, so. That would be fascinating um, to find yeah. out. And then on the right um, are the two versions of the first Jazz Fest poster. We don't know who the designer was, mm -mm. Um, but Whoever it was grabbed two of uh, two Rockmore paintings, and then worked on them a bit because he didn't have those colors in the background. Yeah. And then, of course, this 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 painting just stuns me every time yeah. I see it. And before the when was this acquired by the museum? It was quite a while ago, wasn't it? We've had that, I think, for a while. Yeah, um, I don't remember the exact year. Because it would move around. Uh, uh, a good good friend of mine and I will talk about how we look for it. It, it would get right. moved. First, it was here, and then it was in this hallway, and mm -hmm. then moved there. Oh, uh, Dodie yeah. has already let me know that we got one of the names wrong. Did I? <laughs> My bad. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Shields. Harry Shields. Okay, I will. Uh, I will correct that in the records. Yep. This painting. Uh, it, it, it's it's such a feeling of almost like watching a movie. Looking at it, the paintings that we've seen of him before are in the moment. Their studio pictures or their pictures done in Preservation Hall during the performances, this is now a distillation. He's some years away from that direct observation. Yeah. And he's revisiting it 
but cinematically, I think. And the, the little vignette of the people outside the window, outside the door, the, the window panes of the door, that's, that's just precious. Because you don't see that anymore. They, I don't see that no, they, they ever... Don't, they generally don't open that too often. No. A tiny one. The free clinic. Yeah. Uh, the Maison Bourbon. Yes. So here's a quick little look at how I started in art. These are some teenage efforts. And part of what I wanted to show too is that drawing for me has always been a very, uh, I guess a comfortable thing to do, mm -hmm. something natural, something I didn't have to think about. Here are some uh, early works when I first got to New Orleans in 1977, portrait of my brother on the left, a rather grim looking self-portrait at the top. <laughs> I think it shows uh, the evidence of a few months of being with my dad. Right. <laughs> and then a couple of cemetery scenes. Mm -hmm. And then on the left is a uh, detail from a large painting by my dad called Homage to the French Quarter. I wanted to highlight the skyscraper building at St. Peter and Royal. When I came to New Orleans in February of 1977, my dad had sent me from New York early. Uh, he was selling his place and he said, why don't you go ahead and stay with a friend? Well, the friend turned out to be Gypsy Lou Webb and she was in the skyscraper. So I did this painting of her and another friend of theirs, uh, O.M. And she said, Emily, I think that wall outside of my room is so bare. Why don't you paint something on it? I didn't expect to do a mural, but there I was doing a mural, all from imagination. And uh, Johnny Donnells, who lived in the building, took this picture of me. He had a great photography studio oh, on yeah. the ground floor. Yeah, I remember Johnny. Yeah. And the, the mural suffered over the years, as one might expect. It was outside. It was covered, but outside, the interior courtyard side of the building. But happily, uh, in 2020, I was uh, hired by the owners to come back and restore it. So the photograph on the left shows the state that it was in in 2019. 
then I said, well, I can't paint on it until we get the surface stabilized. I hired uh, Alessia Filetti to do that, and in doing so, uh, more of the image was lost necessarily. So the center picture shows what I was confronted with when I came back to repaint. And then that's what it looks like on, on the right now. And it's still there on the, on the you said on the interior yeah. courtyard? third floor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And in the picture, my dad is at the center. Gypsy Lou is standing on the right. I'm standing on the left. OM has the hat uh, on the left. And then uh, there's a painting of Darlene and, and of uh, Howard Mitchum. And then Johnny Donnell's is at the bottom right. And I started as a Jackson Square artist. And I had a grand time doing it. It was a fun place to be. Uh, there were a lot of portrait painters on Jackson Square at that time. People came from all over the South to get their portraits done. So there were quite a few of us. And on the right shows a copy that I did in pastels of a Rembrandt self-portrait uh, when I was 20 and he had done the original when he was 20. Then the years go by and Noel, he passed in 1995. And of course we had to have a memorial for him at Preservation Hall. And so that's where these two pictures were taken. And the painting that you see of the drummer, that, that one is still hanging in the hall today. They, they still have a lot of Rockmores in there. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, the easel. Yeah. Explain the easel. Well, since I didn't know my grandparents, I, and I didn't have anything of theirs growing up, um, the easel became like a talisman to me because I would see it in my dad's studio over the years after meeting him. And he had painted an inscription on it above the, the uh, little pin that turns the, uh, the screw to hold the, uh, the canvas top. Um, and he, he inscribed on it, it was his mother's easel and signed his name. And I always loved that. I just thought that was so touching, you know. He, he put a little bit of decoration on it, and he clearly felt a tenderness about that, you know. Well, I, don't, I really knew what I was going to do when he passed, and did it very quickly. <laughs> I didn't write my father's easel. I wrote mm -hmm. my grandmother's easel. I may not have known her, but now I can both honor her in the inscription and add my paint to the, to mm -hmm. the surface. And there, of course, is a picture of her painting at the easel in 1958. So to me, it's, uh, it's a rarity. There's yeah. nothing else that I have of hers that's of any significance. But this is a big one. Yeah, the continuity is great. And it's a very solid piece from, sure someone, who has, from someone who has tried to lift it. It's a very <laughs> solid piece. Well, we used it as yeah. the support for every single artwork that was photographed for the, uh, uh, for the book. Oh, yeah. Remember when we used uh, tables on either side for oh Bourbon yeah. Street Parade? Yeah. <laughs> so from uh, New Orleans, I ended up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I ended up very blocked as an artist. I didn't know how really to get back into it. I returned to drawing full time and that, that was Yes, and that was good, but it wasn't enough. And then Preservation Hall Jazz Band came to town in the summer of 2011, and something just clicked. It was a, an electric moment uh, in, in the hall. It was uh, at the Lensic, a wonderful restored uh, theater. And what I felt during that concert was amazing, but what happened at the end of the concert was what made it truly truly exceptional, which was that uh, the band came off the 
stage and started second lining. Well, people in Santa Fe don't second line, so a, a few courageous people got up and danced with them, but very few. And when they swept by us, I grabbed my, my husband, John, and said, come on, we're going. So we danced with them and out to the lobby, and I thought, well, we're going back to our seats. But instead, they said, no, come on up on stage. Well, John and I were the only people who went up on stage. <laughs> and there I was, the band is in the front. We're standing behind them, and I see in the audience faces of my friends. And it was this incredible moment of epiphany. No matter how much I love you all, that's the past. Up here with these people is my future. I just felt it. Mm -hmm. The music stopped. It was the last song. And I saw Ben Jaffe. Now, he'd been a kid when I had been in New Orleans last. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. I go up to him as he's taking off his sousaphone. And I said, Ben, you don't, you don't know me, but I'm Emily. I'm Rockmore's daughter. And he said, you're family. And when he said that to me, I just melted, completely melted. Well, it took three months to get the courage up to come down here, and I had to have some encouragement from a friend here. But I finally, I finally, in talking with John, and said, no, we really have to get down here. And went to Preservation Hall, first time in years. Never had done a drawing in Preservation Hall, ever. Took out my sketch pad and started drawing. And one of the earliest ones is of Jason Marsalis and uh, Lars Edegren and, and Tommy Sankton. Uh, that one was uh, very early in my tenure here in 2011. Mm. And uh, in the drawing on the upper right is a, a little fragment of Will Smith, who is Dodie's baby brother. <laughs> and Dodie on the bottom right. That was uh, done uh, about eight or 10 months after I came back to town. So these are all done at Preservation Hall. Ben Jaffe on the bottom left. Second sousaphone is Ronell Johnson. And I always loved the Pollen Brothers so much, and I don't know the name of the snare drum player there, but uh, I just loved his, his form. And of course, Rockmore is in the background. No. And over the years, I've returned to Preservation Hall as my drawing style has evolved. I use fountain pens, and when you change pens, it makes for a different effect, and I have uh, worked with that. Uh, And on the bottom right, I wanted to speak about Charlie Gabriel. He's a very special friend and a great musician. And he was one of the many people who agreed to pose for me in my studio. And you can see the painting in the exhibition and in the, in, in the book. And these are a few snapshots uh, from our sessions. There's also the great video you did with um Travis that's in the exhibit about how you painted that and how it kind of evolved. How this painting evolved because first of all there were uh, quite a few years between the beginning of the work on the painting and the resumption of the yeah. work. And when Charlie came back he was wearing completely different clothing which I welcomed. It was, right. it was a good change but still challenging. And then he changed his head position and I thought well I don't know if I could should keep accepting these changes, but I like this better. <laughs> but it led to a crisis, which is detailed both in that video and in and the book. book. Yeah. Uh, so I thought I'd show a few more uh, photographs from the sessions because they, that musicians would come to my studio and devote so much time to me to be able to observe them and to record what I was res observing was uh, so, meaningful. And uh, I think you see in the painting something that's different from if you work from photographs or imagination alone. I'm not against photographs. I'm certainly not against imagination. But there is something about observing somebody over time, multiple sessions. And you, you build up a richness, I think, that way. So this is showing Kiana after our very first session. And that shows oh, how my canvases look when I start. I don't start with a blank. I've already mm -hmm. worked on a canvas a lot before the image has begun. I like to have an activated surface. Now, of course, here's the, the wonderful Don Marquis, who sadly we lost just before Satchmo Fest. Yeah. 
And in the bottom right photograph, he's being interviewed by John Ed Bradley, who uh, wrote the uh, picture in a picture, Noel Rockmore and Emily Reese in New Orleans, which is chapter one of the book. And uh, John Ed is here tonight. Very excited that he's here. And I love this photograph uh, because it shows a moment in a portrait session. I, I was not photographing, but a few times. Mostly I was working on the picture of Don and listening to them. Uh, and it, it really, it really was uh, lovely, just lovely to spend the time with both of them that day. That was uh, now two years ago, I guess. Now, Ashlyn Parker posed for a tiny painting, but he was there also to talk about doing a big painting uh, with Trumpet Mafia as the subject. And we were talking about the two canvases behind him as being a Trumpet Mafia diptych. So I'm still, mm. I'm still pondering that. Now, Johnny Vidakovich we had not actually sort of officially met when I started this painting. He was the only person who, where that was the case. Uh, usually I've met people before. I had drawn him and we'd met in passing, mm -hmm. but um, not really so that he'd remember it. And when I called him up, he was so warm and friendly about it. But I, I think he was a little surprised, a little, little uh, taken aback perhaps. But he, he gave freely of his time and he saw it as an improvisational experience. So he was tapping out rhythms and a lot of those rhythms, how I interpreted them, ended up into the painting. <laughs> so these small paintings are all on copper Essentially, they're on what you would use for, for uh, printmaking, uh, either engravings or etchings. Um, I, I like to paint on them. Now, I thought I would end the presentation with the picture that my late husband took of me and my father in 1991, and then the one I took of my dad and Noel with Noel's dogs. Uh, they're on Knoll's balcony um, on Dauphine Street, close to the corner of St. Peter. Those are great. And it's funny because I, my dad could be so difficult, but he could be so sweet and funny and kind. And I think you see that in that photograph of him and me together. There was a genuine bond between us. We'd gotten over the, the hard times of our early uh, months or even the first year or two together and we became very, very close. Very close. Nice to see that. It is. And there we All are. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, do we have any, I don't know, comments, questions, things like that. Um, Caitlin's gonna bring down, since we are streaming this, Caitlin's gonna bring down the microphone so you, the people who are streaming it, you know, out in internet land can, so, wanna bring yeah, it over here? Make sure you're talking to the mic so that the internet land can yeah, hear internet you. Internet land can <laughs> hear you. Hi. Uh, Emily, you made an interesting comment Two, two different interesting things. I guess what I really want to know is how long do you take on a painting? Uh, you, you made mention um, with the painting of the woman in the yellow. I forget her name. Kiana. Kiana. Yeah. Uh, you said, I, star I start, I work on the canvas before she poses for me. That's very interesting to me. So how do you know what your background is going to be until your subject arrives. Uh, give me an idea of how that works. I don't know is the point. It truly is um, a 
process that doesn't include thinking of imagery. It's thinking abstractly. And I work on a lot of those canvases at a time. And so for instance, right now in my studio, there are mostly canvases that don't have images, but that have some kind of background treatment. And they, they, they could be standalone paintings if I wanted to think about them that way. But I prefer to see them as a, a starting point, as providing a, a base of activity and interest. And then, for instance, the one of Kiana, if you look at her skirt, there are striations, horizontal striations. Those were there in the original uh, abstraction. I left and made the decision during the painting not to obscure them fully. As I painted the skirt, the folds of the skirt, I realized, well, that created a kinetic movement, uh, something interesting, and to completely obliterate it would be uh, losing something. That it's an opportunity to have an intersection between the intended and the unintended. That's amazing. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, how long do you think it, how long did it take uh, Noel to do homage to the French Quarter? He worked on it uh, uh, between 1969 and 70, he thought it was finished and it wasn't. He then returned to it multiple times, did major work on it in 19, up, up to 1974. It was in an exhibition in 1974 in Illinois. It was in a catalog, a beautiful reproduction of it in uh, uh, half tone. Then he gets it back from the museum and he repaints it again. And in the book, uh, at the very end of the book, there's a chapter about its development, which is pretty extraordinary because I discovered in his papers, among other things, a little stash of progress pictures, very poor quality, most of them. Uh, some of them Polaroids, poorly lit, but by scanning them into Photoshop and doing what I could to bring out uh, contrast or this and that, uh, it, it's really quite something to look at them. I think the most incredible thing about it is that Gypsy Lou Webb, who is this iconic figure in New Orleans and in the painting is the anchor, she wasn't the original uh, figure. A nude woman was, but he couldn't make up his mind. Would it be back view, front view? Well, he ends up with a very pregnant, full frontal woman all that remains is her foot. <laughs> you can see in the photographic record, the pregnant woman's foot is still in that painting. It's yeah. not Gypsy's foot. <laughs> and, and wearing my turquoise necklace. Wearing your turquoise <laughs> necklace, right. I set for you and I set for your father. Yes, you, yes, you did. When I set for your father, he was very animated, very quick in doing the painting, and all the while, you know, talking on when I set for you, it took hours. <laughs> 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 and you you don't talk and I just find that to be amazing, you being Rockmore's daughter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I may be Rockmore's daughter, but um, I, we have completely different methods of working. Some similarities. We both like to start with uh, a darker ground. I was doing that before I met him and was astonished when I met him when I was 20 to discover, oh, he does that too. Yeah. Anybody else? was an influence at least to get you down the mysticism of her art probably pulled at you at some level. A comment would be interesting. I, I adore her as I adore your work. Well, uh, you. uh, second, um, your father's work and to some degree of yours has an, uh, an uh, effect on the subject's anatomy. And if particularly your father, it's not naturalistic. Uh, it is uh, whatever is unusual about the anatomical aspect of each subject is exaggerated to some degree. And almost every one of your father's 
uh, musician images shows deformity of the right hand. Mm -hmm. uh, either it's elongated or it's twisted or it's wrapped around. It's an obvious in every single one of his paintings. I couldn't help but wonder if he was a lefty. But um, No, his sister was. Um, I think that he, because he did these so quickly, he didn't devote, it would have taken a whole nother session to do hands properly. And he just wasn't giving that to these. And I think he and Larry decided it, it wasn't necessary, just leave it. But I, I would say that he, he didn't give that attention for, for a reason. And it, it would have been that they, they, they didn't call for, for that kind of attention. Yes, but you see unusual aspects of facial expression, exaggeration of line, smile, well, frown. Well, he was known for that. Um, he did that in portraiture um, across the board. It wasn't mm -hmm. uh, only musicians. It's there very effective, times when very effective. There were times when people really didn't like it. Uh, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Don Marquis and other people spoke about that. Yes. <laughs> And George O'Keefe? I was not a fan of her work until later in life. Um, when, I was, when I was younger, I, I didn't relate to it very well. But later on, I, I came to love her work. And if, living in Santa Fe, I got to see a, a, a lot of examples. Thanks for the presentation. It was wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's been wonderful to have you here. Anyone else? Anything? All right. Well, again, thank you for coming. Um, the book is for sale right out the door. Yes, and I will be um, signing copies if anyone would like the book inscribed. Um, so uh, get one. It makes a great Hanukkah, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Kwanzaa present. So you know, <laughs> don't hesitate. So, and thank you all for coming. Please come back soon. Thank you.